Let's close our eyes. Our gracious Father in heaven, again we find ourselves in your presence. First of all, because we have a longing, Father, to see your face. We have a longing, Father, to know that you know us. We have come to your house, gracious Father, because we want to hear your words. We want you to speak to us. We want you to show us the way so that we can walk in it. Thank you for these studies that have been prepared for us. As we delve into this past week's lesson, Spirit of God, please guide us. Dear Jesus, may we see you afresh today. For we ask this, dear Jesus, in your lovely name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, dear friends, let's um, look at this, the heading of today's past um, or the past week's lesson has Jesus opens the way through now let's get into this you had to look at chapters like Hebrews chapter 9 Exodus 19 Hebrews 12 Leviticus 16 Hebrews 10 Colossians 3 now all of these are basically key verses in order to understand what we were going to look at Let's look at our memory text, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. Will you please go with me to Hebrews chapter 9, and we are going to look at verse 24. <clears throat> Do you have it? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. Now, as always, I'm reading out of the New International, and it says, For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which, sorry, which are copies of the true. This is now taken out of the New King James Version. But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. That's our memory text. Now, what I really enjoyed in this past week's lesson study is if you perhaps only had time to address, maybe, or look at Sabbath's introduction of this past week, you basically got in a nutshell everything that was said in the week that followed, in the days that followed. So let's look at this. The author tells us <clears throat> that there is a purpose for us, a purpose as to why we have a desire. So let's just quickly look at the headings because these headings summarize the lesson study. On Sunday section, we had the heading Jesus before the Father, <clears throat> telling us that after Christ had finished and completed his work on planet Earth, his next role or his next function was to go into the presence of the Father. And something has to happen there. Then we have God's invitation. What is this invite that God has? And it talks about the intimacy of the relationship that God wants to have. The need for a veil. Why do we have a need for a veil? The interesting thing that a new and living way through the veil. The veil initially was put there to protect us, but now we have a way, way through the veil by which we can now be protected to go into the presence of God. And then, as it says, the, what will happen when we go through the veil? They will see his face. Now, dear friends, what I recognize is that God, from the beginning, when he created Adam and Eve, created the, them with the purpose of fellowship. We often read in the stories in Genesis chapter 3, particularly, and Genesis chapter 2, 
how that God would often come down and communicate with them and had fellowship with them. And they, Adam and Eve, could see God face to face without any fear of death. But then sin steps in. But I want you to notice something. And will you do this with me? Jump across to Genesis chapter 3 with me. Genesis chapter 3. And I want you to notice something. We read about the fall of Adam and Eve and how that they find themselves to be naked and um, they hide. But as it was God's custom, it is, we read there in verse 8, so Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. And please, dear friends, remember, you must follow with me. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord, sorry, from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now I want you to imagine this. Up to this time, there was open communion. No problem with talking with God. But all of a sudden, sin does something. The first thing that sin does, sin causes a separation. Not in the mind of God as much as in our minds. And truthfully, what God had predicted, that sin would separate us from God. But I want you to notice right in the garden there already, God doesn't want this relationship to come to an end. But he recognizes that sin has now come between us and God. But God then deals with sin. Why? Because he wants to still have communication with his children. Even the children that find themselves in a fallen state. Do you understand that? So God has never wanted separation. In actual fact, he's wanted communication with us. Now this whole week's lesson is actually showing us how that God successfully made it possible for us as sinners to again find ourselves without fear in the presence of God. So we're going to have a look at this and how this is all developed. Christ actually makes it clear right there in Genesis that he is going to put enmity between us and sin. That he's going to put in our hearts a hatred for sin because it is only when we confess our sin that it is removed and therefore we can now come into the presence of God because sin is no longer separating us. And we get a glimpse of this already in Genesis chapter 3. And maybe we should just flick back. I've already um, closed it off. But just go back to Genesis chapter 3. And I want you to notice something that is so interesting about um, the ending verses of Genesis chapter 3. It says there in verse 21, this was after God's instruction to Adam what he was going to do in Eve and then finally to the serpent. God says to them both in verse 21, the Lord God, listen to this, who's taking the initiative? It's always the Lord God. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Do you see that? God was the one that took the initiative to deal with our sin. Now, dear friends, it was before we even dealt with the sin. God is dealing with it. So I want you just to bear in mind as we look at this lesson that Jesus opened a way for God to be able to communicate with man. Do you understand? But this is a two-way um, process. First of all, God had to deal with sin because sin is his enemy. Do you understand? But we have to recognize that sin is our enemy and we have to deal with sin also. Because even though God has removed sin from his side, 
and made it possible for man to have communication. Man still has sin and needs to now do something with that sin so that he can be found in the presence of God. Otherwise, even though God has dealt with sin, sin still separates us from God. So this whole process of what we're looking at is the way in which the Father is dealing with sin and the way in which we have been given an opportunity to deal with sin also. But just be reminded, dear friends, that you will, want, you will not want a veil to be removed if sin is still a factor. Because you must remember that sin separates us from God. And sometimes we actually want sin to be in our lives because it is a way in which, in some sense, we are veiled from God. So I want you to notice we are going to play with the veil, the need for a veil. Now, a veil can be a positive uh, separation or it can also be a separation that is, comes from a negative um, background. And I'll explain this as we go on. So I want you to recognize that this whole um, process that we are going to be looking into was for the purpose of removing a veil from God's side and then from our side. And yet, the way that it's removed from our side is not even our doing. It's God's doing when he became a man in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus removes the veil, removes sin. So we're going to see this in greater depth. So let's get into it. Remember that we understand that when Jesus was on the cross of Calvary, he said these words in his closing breath. It is finished. What was he talking about? He was talking about the plan that God had implemented for Christ to be able to be man's representative, to be man's advocate, to be man's sacrifice. So I want you to understand that the first work which we found in the first apartment was to actually um, be the means by which God, the King of the universe, the Alpha and Omega, who has no beginning, who has no end, to actually have a beginning and an end. Because we are defined on planet Earth as people who have a beginning and an end. And in order for God to be truly human, he had to have a beginning and an end. And we find this beginning there in Bethlehem when he is born. And we find his end on the cross of Calvary when he dies. So in some way, Jesus, being the Son of God, truly on the cross of Calvary, ended his role in being the Son of Man entirely. So it means that the Son of God's part of him was laid dormant for a while. But while he developed the sonship of man to be the Son of Man, and that was to actually stand in the, the place of first Adam, to be man's representative. Now, he successfully was that perfect sacrifice, which we discovered so far in our lesson studies. He fulfilled the obligations of what God required of man, his creation. God required obedience to his law, Christ becoming man um, fulfilled that specification by giving full obedience to the law. But then the interesting thing, then on the cross of Calvary, he becomes our death for us. He dies our death. And therefore, he truly 
completes the total role of being man. But now, that work is finished. The next interesting thing that takes place is that Jesus has to return back to the Father. Now, there's two things that take place which we've already discovered, and that is, first of all, to find out if what Christ had successfully done on planet Earth, if that met the criteria of what the Father expected of mankind. So now the interesting thing, that first of all, the Father would not have resurrected Christ if there was any sin found in his life. So the sheer fact that the Father resurrected Christ was already an indication that the, the role that Christ played not only fulfilled man's specifications, but because of what Christ has done, he could be resurrected. He had no sin that could separate him from God. Now, although that was done, and although he was the perfect representation of man, it meant nothing unless that work did something meant something, could be used for something. And it's so interesting that the message that we have as a church is the message of reconciliation. So what Christ is now doing, he's reconciling us to the Father through the merits of his life. So we actually have this word the day of atonement or the day of being reconnected, a oneness with God again. And this is the work that Christ is busy with. So I want you to understand something, that Jesus, and it's beautiful to see that we're not talking about the Lord God and we're not talking about Christ who was the Messiah, we're talking about Jesus. And when you use the phrase or the name Jesus, you are reminded of Gabriel's words to both Mary and to Joseph that you will call this boy child Jesus because um, this is what God wants him to be called. He is God's Savior. He is God's Son. He is God's means of dealing with sin from his side so that he can again have communication with man. Now imagine this. Here is Christ. He goes into the presence of the Father. So will you please just move across to um, Sunday section. And we see there clearly in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 24 what we've just been reading that Christ did not enter an earthly sanctuary built by human hands, but as an actual fact, gone into the very presence of God. Do you understand? He's gone into God's presence. Now, how can man, the Jesus person, be found in the presence of God and live? The only reason why he can be found in the presence of God and live is because he did not violate the law. Do you understand? So he now stands in the presence of God. But bear in mind now that he represents mankind. He is man's advocate. So listen to the wording again. Are we just reminding ourselves? Jesus is our advocate before the Father. So listen to my choice of words. Jesus is our advocate before the Father. That means he represents us. When we come before God, we don't come before him and say, here I am. We come before God and say, here's our representative, Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you understand? So in God's dealings with us, he's dealing with us through Christ. Now the most beautiful thing is that we are counseled in Corinthians that God is reconciling the world to himself through Christ. Isn't that beautiful? And we are allowing from our side to be reconciled to God 
through Christ. So Christ has become the glue between us and the Father and the Father in us. Christ has become that glue that bonds us together. And it's a bond that will never be separated. And that is the brilliance of what is happening. So Jesus, as man, goes before God. And God accepts Jesus as man because he has not violated the laws of God. So he accepts man. Do you understand? So I would almost like to say, just as the word Adam can be translated mankind, or when you speak about when God said, let us make man, he was talking about let us make mankind. When we see Jesus being the last Adam, as 1 Corinthians 15 teaches us, then it means that Adam, the last Adam, was mankind. So when Jesus stands before the Father, mankind is now standing before the Father. And this mankind has now successfully dealt with, with the, the keeping of the, the law. Therefore, there is no sin in him. But not only did he satisfy that, not only was he sinless so that there would be no um, fear of death, but he also became death for us who has violated that law. So this, there's an incredible thing that's taking place. But now the interesting thing is that in Christ, he is the forerunner, the one going before us, which means something. If he is the forerunner, what does it mean you can get behind the forerunner? You get other runners. You get others who are running in the same direction to get to the same place. And it's beautiful because it means this, that just as Christ was interested in getting back with God, to be back in harmony with God, we, as his children, are running with this one purpose, to get back in harmony with God, to get back to be with God, and we are following the path blazed by our forerunner. Which means that in some way, the sin that is in our lives, which has separated us from God, is now going to be removed. Okay, so this this work or this function, when Christ left earth, he left earth as a human. Now let me explain this. He came to earth as God, Emmanuel, with us. So God becomes human. But then he goes back to God, but he goes where man now goes into the presence of God. So God comes into the presence of man and is veiled in the body of Christ. And Christ goes into the presence of Father, of the Father, the Godhead, and is veiled or clothed in the veil of man. So we have this interesting thing, but now we're talking about our veil. So let's move on. Here in God's invitation, which was Monday section, it was, and we have the story where God is dealing with the Israelites. And dear friends, just for a brief moment here, sometimes when we look at historical aspects such as this experience where God is inviting the, the, the Israelites to come and have fellowship with him and they they scared, they don't want to go nearby and they recognize that God is a consuming fire and they say, let Moses speak to us and we have all of this taking place. And we tend to say, oh, those Israelites, it was all about them. But can I just remind you of something? The Israelites consisted of 12 tribes. And these 12 tribes came from the bosom of one man. And his name initially was Jacob. So in some sense, the 12 tribes were the descendants of Jacob. But Jacob has a very interesting experience. He wrestles with God. And while wrestling with God, there comes a place in this wrestling match 
when God says to Jacob, let me go. But Jacob holds on to God with everything that he has. And he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. Now, the most interesting thing in that moment, the way in which God shows that Moses has, sorry, that Jacob has found favor with God is that God changes his name and he calls him Israel. Now, the word Israel, when you understand it, is not just a name, but he's saying something. It says one who has wrestled with God and was victorious. So, dear friends, you can be the Israels of God if you have wrestled with God and said to God, I will not let you go until you bless me. Then you will receive that title as one who has wrestled with God and prevailed, and as such you become an Israelite. Do you understand? You do not have to be of the descendants of Jacob. You have to go through the experience of Jacob, and that's the wrestling match. Now, I honestly do believe, dear friends, that in the world that we are living in now, we are going through what they call the Jacob's wrestle. Now, part of everything that we're doing is this wrestling match. Being brought back into God's presence with open communication with him. I can't help but think of the words that God said to Miriam and Aaron when they questioned as to what was the value of Moses. Where God said to them, I speak to people through dreams and visions, and in some way that's availing. But then he said, with my servant Moses, I speak face to face, without a veil. Do you understand? So let's look at this. God's invitation to us is to come into his presence, to have open communication with him, just as he had with Moses and the, the elders of the different tribes. But the people feared God. And what caused them to fear God was their lack of faith, their lack, the lack of understanding that God was going to, or has, but in that stage was going to deal with sin so that they could be found in his presence. But they say, no, we don't. Now, the interesting thing is that immediately, because God's invitation, um, the people become conscious of their sin, and it's so interesting that the lesson, and I was just amazed, I was reminded of certain things, but in the lesson, when the people bow down to the golden image, God's reaction to that was, I do not want to be involved with these people anymore. And he wanted to separate himself from them. Do you understand? Now, the reason why he wanted to separate himself from them was because of sin. You see, God does not accommodate sin. Sin will separate us from our Heavenly Father. He does not like sin. He does not love sin but he loves the sinner. And dear friends, it doesn't help for us as sinners to love sin. We must hate sin. We must have an enmity towards sin. Do you understand? But, so God says, I do not want to be with them. Moses does something. He separates, he takes the sanctuary and he puts it outside of the camp of the Jewish nation, of the Israelites puts himself outside, places it outside. That means they no longer were in communion with God. They were separated from God. And dear friends, that's not a good place to be because if you're separated from God, just as the branch is separated from the vine, it cannot survive unless it's connected to the vine. So our sins separated us from God and God had to do something about it. Now, this is the most incredible part is that all of a sudden God does something. In the way in which he designs the, the tribes to meet and camp, there was this vacuum created in the middle, a big space. And in the center of that space, God's tabernacle was found, God's presence. 
But around the tabernacle, we found the Levites. The Levites, in a sense, became a means by which they protected the temple from the people that were around it. So they became the means by which people could only have access to God through the Levites, through their ministry. They no longer had direct access themselves. The tent of meeting now became a place where the priests and the high priests met. The rest of the tribes gathered around but were not in the presence of God. Do you understand? So they became the buffer between that. And particularly now, we have, so veils initially meant, the need for a veil was that there had to be something that separated people from another. But I also want you to notice something else about the veil. For example, the priests could go into the holy place through the first veil. There was a doorway, a separation that kept the priests outside of the, the and the people outside of the, um, the holy place. But the interesting thing for the priests to come into the holy place, there was a basin of water where they had to wash themselves, etc., before they could go and function in the holy place, where before they could take the blood and go and put it on the altar of offering. So there was somehow people didn't have access. So sinners didn't have access into the sanctuary. They had to go through the ministry of the priest. But the priest himself now also needed to be ministered to. And in some sense, that was the function. Now, let me explain this. So the priest, to a certain extent, the veil kept most of the people out. But the first veil allowed the people, priests, Levites, to go into the holy place. But they were kept out of the most holy place, which was the Shekinah glory of God, God's presence, by the inner veil. The, the, the veil within the sanctuary. So, the veil within the sanctuary kept people out of there that should not be in there. Just as the veil, the first veil, kept the, the normal or general people population out of going into the holy place. And dear friends, there's lessons to be learned from this. Not everybody can automatically, in that time, um, like, for example, a, a, the people from the tribe, tribe of Judah could not say, well, I'm going to be a priest. They couldn't. The first veil only allowed the tribes of Levi in. But the second veil, which separated the holy place from the most holy, only allowed the high priest. Now, we again, through our studies, have discovered that Jesus is our high priest. And he has gone before us through the veil. Do you understand? Now, there's a reason why I'm doing this, that veils initially served for two purposes. They served to protect the people from the glory of God, because the glory of God would consume him. No sin can be found in the presence of God. It's going to be consumed. So the veil protected them. But the second thing that the veil did, it also um, allowed the right people into the right place to do the, the particular work that they had to do. So, we have priests doing a work, but we have the high priest going into the most holy place. Now, Christ was priest and high priest because he did the work of priest. He became the sacrifice. He was the light of the world. He was the bread of life, etc. But from there, and this is what I want you to understand, on the cross of Calvary, he moved from being in the presence of the, the holy place into the presence of the most holy place, which is into God's presence. But now he's fulfilling a role in God's presence. Now remember I said to you that Jesus is our advocate before the Father, our representative. He is mankind before the Father. He re represents mankind. So when God is dealing with Jesus, he's dealing with mankind. Now what we've picked up from God is that he's accepted mankind because mankind has 
kept the laws of God and mankind has fulfilled the obligation and now mankind can be found in his presence. But now we who are mankind can't come in. We come through the veil. We come through Christ. We can't go into his presence and live. But mankind in Christ can go into the presence of God and live. Now you wonder why I'm bringing this all out. But remember now that he is our advocate before the Father. But then the most interesting thing which comes out in the lesson study. When Christ is inaugurated in heaven. When he moves through. Now this inauguration is really important. Because it means that there's a, there's a role of work which Christ couldn't do until he had completed the first one. So when he completed the first one and said, it is finished, he moved from that one into the presence of God to fulfill another function. And he was, in, he was equipped. He became Lord and Savior. He, be, he was equipped in order to be able to do something now. He even comes back to the disciples and in Matthew 28 says to them, all authority has been given to me on, in heaven and on earth. So what happened is that by Jesus going into the presence of the Father, an inauguration took place. Now to show that this inauguration took place, something happened. And you should know from the lesson study what happened. What was the sign of the inauguration that Christ now had been accepted by the Father and could now play this role as being man's representation in God's presence. How could he now do this? How do we know that it was accepted? And we know because Jesus said that I will, when, I, I, when I've left you, you know, and in John chapter 16, that is so clear. Jesus says to the disciples, I have to go. I have to leave you. Because I'm leaving you for the purpose so that when I leave you, I will send the advocate to you, the Holy Spirit. So now the interesting thing, we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ. But the Godhead has an advocate in our presence, and that is the Holy Spirit. So now let me explain. The moment the inauguration was accepted by the Father... The, the sending of the Holy Spirit, which is the day of Pentecost, was a clear indication that this new role of Christ had now begun. He now was no longer just to be sacrificed, but the sacrifice had now been accepted and he was now made Lord and Savior. Do you understand? So the beauty is, that when Christ went into the presence of the Father, a lot of things happened, which we, we just discover. He goes in and accepts the invitation of the Father on our behalf. He goes in and he goes beyond the veils, which separated us from the Father, because he removed the veils. He removed the separations. And so we have a new and living way through Jesus Christ. But now I want you to notice something. They will see his face. Now, when I looked at this, which is Thursday's section, and you'll notice I'm jumping around a lot. But I want you to notice by now we've discovered why we needed a veil, because sin needed to protect us, not only from God's wrath or his burning, consuming presence, but it needed to protect us from being... Um, to, to take things where we were not allowed to be. Just let me just explain something here. Do you remember, and it was in the lesson study, when Aaron's sons went into God's presence with strange fire? God consumed them. Do you understand? So in some way, they did not recognize the holiness or the purpose of the veil. And they went into God's presence unsanctified. <laughs> And so what does God do? He sanctifies his presence by the consuming of the two sons. Now listen to this, dear friends. Sin cannot be found in the presence of God. 
because he is going to sanctify himself of it. That means he's going to purify himself of sin. And the way in which he purifies himself of sin is to destroy sin. So we have this interesting thing. But I want you to notice that Thursday's section had such an interesting heading. And that heading was this one. They will see his face. Now listen to this, dear friends. It was so interesting. They will see his face. Now when you look at the word will, it means, it can mean two things. It can mean that in the future they will see his face. But it can also imply that now we can see his face. Now it's true, dear friends, that, that having accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven to fetch his children, we will see God face to face. But already now, we will and can see God's face face to face. Now, so how will we be able to see it? And the will here is not just in the future we will be able to be, which we will. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say, Christ has gone before that for us and he's in the presence of the Father. And being in the presence of the Father, mankind is in the presence of the Father and therefore we see God's face right now, but through Christ and by faith. But faith is a very interesting thing. According to Hebrews 11 verse 1, faith is sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. Now let me explain this. In Christ we see and hope, but we see a reality. We are in the presence of God. But this reality that we through faith experience will become a reality realistically. So what does faith do? Faith allows me to grab something that is now, or let me change it. Faith allows me to grab something that I will inherit in the future and live as if I've got it now. So listen to my choice of words. Faith says that I am in the presence of God now. And faith allows me then to recognize this reality now that I am in the presence of God. And because I am now in the presence of God, I behave as a person who is in the presence of God in reality. So let me explain. When I get to heaven, according to Revelation, no murderer will get there. Do you understand? So a person who makes it to heaven doesn't then become a, a saint, a person who doesn't murder. By faith already on planet earth, I believe that I'm in God's presence. And so here already, I stop being a murderer. I stop breaking the laws. So by faith, I live the life that Christ lived. The life that I one day will live, where I will not violate the law. I live that by faith now. I live as if I am a law-abiding citizen. I live not to break the law. I live to keep the law as if I was already in the very presence of God. Now to me, this part, when Jesus as man's representation went before God, he gave to us hope that we too can stand now already in God's presence, just as one day, Literally, 
physically we will stand in God's presence. Just as we believe we will stand in God's presence without sin, so here on planet earth we can stand before God without sin. But again, I want you just to be reminded, not because of your doings, but you stand in God's presence in Christ. So you stand in His presence now on the, the works of Christ, on the merits of Christ, not on your own merits. But one day you will stand in the presence of God on your own merits. You will be one day what Jesus is already. You will be like Jesus. Thank you.